Wonderful. Okay, I'll get us started. I see some people are joining us already. Um, thank you everyone for joining today and happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, my name is Katie DeMalley. I am a program director at the French American Foundation. And today we are discussing Brexit. Uh, the title of the talk is Brexit, what are the consequences for both Ireland's? And we're going to examine the impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. We have a wonderful guest speaker with us, David O'Sullivan, who is the former ambassador of the EU to the United States. We're very excited for your words, David. Um, First, before we move to David, I would like to introduce our moderator, Alexi Mojaiski. Alexi is a French diplomat serving as spokesperson and chief of staff at the French Mission to the United Nations in New York since 2018. Before that, Alexi worked at the Quai d'Orsay, first as a desk officer on Central African Affairs within the Africa Department, and then on political affairs within the Department for United Nations International Organizations human rights and francophonie. So Alexi, I will let you take it from here to introduce David and to begin the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for the French American uh, uh, Foundation for, for this warm welcome and this interesting topic. I will start with, a, uh, um, first of all, uh, wishing everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day as uh, the, the thing are well organized and we are discussing Ireland on St. Patrick's Day. And with a short disclaimer, as I precise that I'm not acting as a spokesperson for the French mission, but only in my capacity as a member of the Transatlantic uh, Forum. Ambassador O'Sullivan, it's an honor and a privilege to, um, uh, uh, and but most of all, a pleasure uh, to be there with you and have the opportunity to introduce you as um, our guest speaker. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you were born in 1953 in Dublin, uh, Republic of Ireland. You studied economics and socio uh, sociology at Trinity College, of which you got graduated in uh, 1975, uh, sorry, before attending the College of Europe in Bruges, where you earned a postgraduate uh, diploma of advanced European studies. Um, this may be the starting point of a committed European and a uh, European career. Indeed, after your studies, you started working at the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade until uh, 1979. Then you joined the European Commission six years after Ireland uh, joined the European Economic Community. This started a brilliant uh, career as a European civil servant, which will lead you uh, to inter alia uh, the positions of chief of staff to President Romano Prodi uh, from 1999, uh, sorry, to uh, 2000, and then to Secretary General of the European Commission from 2000 to 2005. You were appointed in 2005 Director General for DG Trade, one of the most important department uh, within uh, the European system and a European system that focused mainly on economic integration. After this position in 2010, you became Director General of DG Relax um, with uh, the responsibility of setting up the uh, European External Action Service, the Foreign Ministry of uh, the EU, in which you took the central position of uh, chief operating uh, officer from 2010 to uh, 2014. Afterwards, you were called to serve as ambassador of the European Union to the United States from 2014 to 2019. You are now a senior counselor for Step 2 in uh, Brussels, advising on trade policy and uh, EU trade. Um, this portrait will not be complete without uh, mentioning that uh, while at Trinity, you were a uh, debating gold medalist of the College Historical Society and a winner of the Irish Times debating competition. You are moreover one of the current vice presidents uh, of the HIST, uh, the College Historical Society of, of Trinity College. Uh, so this augurs well for our exchange today, I think. Um, Without further delay, Mr. Ambassador, let's start maybe with a first broad question uh, on, on the issue that interests us uh, today. Uh, the Leave vote has won in 2016. The departure of the UK from the European Union, Union is effective since uh, January 2020. Uh, and uh, the transition period ended on the 31st of December. 
what are now concretely the implication of Brexit and of this process for both islands, apart from the fact that France is now Ireland's closest neighbor within the EU, obviously. Uh, you said in a previous webinar, I saw that, that uh, Brexit was always going to be very bad news for Ireland, both north and, and, uh, and, and south. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alexis. Uh, thank you, Katie, and thank you to the French American Foundation for this invitation on, on St. Patrick's Day. And happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. Uh, I know it's going to be a very subdued St. Patrick's Day uh, in New York. Uh, it, it always struck me that Americans uh, celebrated St. Patrick's Day much more as a party than we, we ever did in Ireland. When I was growing up, St. Patrick's Day was actually more of a religious holiday and a family holiday. There were, the pubs were closed. Uh, <laughs> there was... Uh, the, the only great benefit of St. Patrick's Day when you were a child was that if you were Catholic and if you were observing Lent on St. Patrick's Day, you were absolved from your uh, Lenten abstinence. So if you'd given up sweets for Lent, you were allowed to indulge in chocolates. That was about as exciting as St. Patrick's Day got during my childhood, but it's, it's moved on since then. But uh, this year, it'll be very subdued everywhere, everywhere in the world. Um, Look, uh, yes, I, I think, I mean, I would say, uh, along with Michel Barnier, that, uh, you know, there was never going to be any value added in, 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 in Brexit. It was going to be bad news for everyone, bad news for the EU, for EU27, bad news for the UK. But uh, honestly, I think, yes, it was particularly bad news for, for Ireland, North and South. Um, maybe start with the, the, the South of Ireland, uh, the Republic. Uh, um, the though we have a troubled history with the United Kingdom, uh, we joined uh, the EU with the, the UK. And it's quite interesting. I mean, in some ways, we were uh, what I think Stalin would have called objective allies, because of course, having been a, a British colony for so long, we we'd inherited much of the British administrative and legal systems. So in some ways, we had similar issues with some of the European questions that came along, with the exception of the common agricultural policy. Ireland was a huge supporter of the CAP uh, uh, and frequently allied with France in that regard. Uh, the UK was always very, very skeptical. But I think, generally speaking, uh, uh, being with the UK in the, in the EU uh, was important for Ireland also because of our close relations uh, with the UK. And of course, when we joined in 1973, you should not forget this was at the height of the problems in Northern Ireland when you know the IRA were planting bombs in, in public houses and on mainland uh, UK where an attempted assassination on, on Mrs. Thatcher. These were extremely difficult times and joint membership of the e EU actually helped facilitate, I think, a, a progressive um, friendship between Ireland and the United Kingdom, which in my view would have been much more difficult if we had not both been members of the EU. The contacts which ministers had on a daily basis and so forth greatly facilitated uh, that. So when, when you then look at the impact of the departure of the UK just for the south of Ireland for a moment, I mean, two, two particular things come to mind, of course. Uh, one is, though uh, Irish dependence on the UK market had radically changed over the last uh, 45 years. Uh, when we joined the EU, I think it was something like 60%, 70% of our exports went to the UK. Uh, today, that figure is closer to 11 or 10%. So we have greatly diversified. So the actual export dependence is much less. Two factors need to be borne in mind. One is that uh, the, the indigenous Irish industries, mainly I would say in the area of uh, agriculture and food processing, are still heavily dependent on, on, on the UK market. Um, uh, and the idea that there would be tariffs, for example, on agricultural or processed food uh, exports to the UK would have been a disaster for uh, many sectors of the Irish economy. Now, thankfully, that's been avoided with the uh, um, uh, trade and cooperation agreement. Uh, but the other factor is that uh, about 70 percent of Irish exports transit through uh, the UK. They don't, they don't end up in the UK, but they transit through. So the, the increased friction at the ports uh, in Holyhead arriving from Dublin uh, or in, in Calais uh, arriving from, from, from Dover, uh, this so-called land bridge, which is where most of the Irish exports transited into, into the continent, 
uh, was going to be hugely challenging. And one of the interesting phenomena of, of Brexit is that you see a massive increase in direct tra uh, contacts now, ferries between the south of Ireland and, and France, uh, Belgium, and, and indeed the Netherlands. And there has been a very dramatic increase in that for, for that reason. So it was always going to be bad news for, 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 for the south of Ireland. Now, for the north of Ireland, of course, uh, the issues were even more existential and, and political. Um, the, the fact is that uh, while it only makes a couple of, while the Good Friday Agreement, the peace settlement of 1998, only makes a couple of references to the European Union, uh, it was joint membership of the U U Union by the UK and Ireland, which really underpinned the possibilities of, the, of this agreement. Why? The, the Good Friday Agreement was basically predicated on two things more complicated than that, but I oversimplify. One was, and this was very important, a guarantee to the unionist majority in Northern Ireland that there would be no change in the constitutional status of Northern Ireland without the consent of the majority in Northern Ireland. Now, this was a very big evolution because traditional Irish republicanism challenged the legitimacy of Northern Ireland and basically said, Northern Ireland doesn't, doesn't have the right to exist, Anything that's decided has to be decided on an all Ireland basis, which of where, of course, there is a nationalist majority. And this was very threatening to the unionists. So they received this guarantee and the Irish uh, Ireland, the, the south of Ireland, took out of its constitution something which had been there for a long time, which was a territorial claim on Northern Ireland, basically saying Ireland consists of the whole island and we only temporarily acknowledge the fact that we don't control Northern Ireland. This was changed and uh, taken out. So this was a guarantee given uh, to the unionist uh, uh, people in Northern Ireland. For the nationalists, because we had joined, we were both in the EU, we had dismantled the border with 1992, the single market, the single customs union. So there was effectively only the only reason you needed checks at the border in, in 1998 was still the security situation. The Good Friday Agreement settled the security situation, the war was over, uh, the, the, the military and police checks on the border were dismantled, so there was no border. So you could, you could on a day-to-day -day basis, it was like living in a united Ireland. For, for, for nationalists, they could move freely, north and south, they could work in the north, li live in the south, work in the south, uh, live in the north. Uh, the, when, you trans when you cross the border, the only way you knew you were crossing the border was when you got a ping on your mobile phone saying you changed provider from a, an Irish provider to, to a British provider. And, and this was, uh, if you like, a very delicate balance, which was then profoundly disturbed by Brexit because Brexit was about recreating borders. Let's face it, that's, that was the purpose of Brexit. It was to take back control of the border. And uh, if this was self-evident uh, uh, at the English Channel, uh, the only land border which was Brit the UK was gonna have was on the island of Ireland. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that Tony Blair, John Major, British Prime Minister, successive Irish ambassadors and ministers tried to explain during the referendum that this would be a consequence of Brexit. Uh, nobody in, in the UK really took any account of this. And then they were almost deeply shocked when it was said, yes, but you do realize that now we have an issue about the border on, on Ireland. What are you going to do about this border? Uh, and the border had to go somewhere. Either you had a border on the island of Ireland, which would be deeply resisted by many in Northern Ireland, because you need to understand that the demographics of Northern Ireland, that where the border runs is in fact heavily nationalist areas. The, the unionist areas tend to be further north and further away from the border. So you would have had a lot of uh, unhappiness about the, 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 re, the, the reestablishment of a border. The other alternative was a border between Ireland and the rest of the EU, so effectively Ireland, the, the, the Republic of Ireland, would have had to take a semi-detached uh, membership of the European Union, which was for, for a vote over which they had no control. Or the third alternative, which is where we've ended up, and we can come back to that, is to put a some kind of a, a border down the Irish Sea uh, so that you can have at ports and airports in Northern Ireland the checks needed uh, on the flow of goods uh, in order to avoid that this requires new infrastructure on the island of Ireland. This has been, you know, it took many, many 
months of negotiation for this finally to, to be recognized as a problem and many, many convoluted negotiations, and we can go back to that if you wish, Alexis, um, to end up with this, this solution, which is what we, we now have. So unfortunately, this has deeply destabilized the situation in Northern Ireland because uh, a border on the land would have destabilized the nationalists and arguably a border on the sea, even though it is the only alternative, uh, it, it creates a lot of unhappiness on the part of unionists who feel that they somehow that the the constitutional link uh, with the UK is is somehow weakened, even though uh, this arrangement has no direct impact on the constitutional status of Northern Ireland. So this has been very very destabilizing in Northern Ireland. Sorry, that's a rather long answer to to a first question, but perhaps it helps frame. I can try to be shorter than to other questions. No, thank you. It's it's interesting to have the yes the big frame on the on on, on this issue before going maybe more uh, a bit into into the detail. Indeed, uh, one of the blocking points during negotiation of a Brexit was the has been the Irish border uh, and uh, peace in Ireland uh, was one of the fundamental interests uh, for for the EU with the rights of citizens and uh, and the financial source settlements with uh, yeah. with the UK. Um, so maybe you could tell us. A, a bit more about how important the Good Friday Agreement remains for nowadays islands and also how Brexit upsets uh, this agreement. You already said a, a bit about that. Um, but uh, maybe, uh, yes, going back maybe a bit more in the detail because we, we so see that, um, in fact, uh, tensions are, are rising. Um, now, uh, in 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 the practice of uh, of of this protocol, uh, was this week uh, the the EU formally launching legal action against uh, the UK, uh, alleging that uh, Her Majesty's government has broken international law over over Brexit implementation in, in Northern Ireland, uh, following other uh, also. Um, uh, de declarations from uh, from both sides, so. There, 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 there is this, um, this, uh, this protocol that um, has to that has the the function, the the purpose of of preserving the uh, the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement, but also the question of how to uh, to uh, overcome the current difficulties. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, I go back to my earlier answer. The the, the Good Friday Agreement was a very delicate balance between two communities that with fundamentally opposed visions of, of the place where they live. Um, for the Unionists, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, they see themselves as British, they see themselves as completely linked to the United Kingdom, to the British Crown, to the British constitutional system. Uh, the nationalist community feel that they were cut off from Irish independence, that they were deprived Irish independence by being sucked into this uh, part of Ireland which remained in the United Kingdom. They have never accepted the legitimacy of that state. They always felt uh, second-class citizens in that in that state, uh, and the objective of the Good Friday, and, and this is what gave rise ultimately to the, the the war, basically, which is what we had for thirty years, and we should not forget, um, you know, nearly three thousand, I think about over three thousand, three thousand five hundred people died, which doesn't sound like a lot of people um, when you look at say the, the 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 twin towers, but if you scale it up to uh, a, a, an American uh, scale, you're talking more like 50, 60, or even 100,000 people. So it was, it was for Northern Ireland, it was really quite a large scale confrontation with, with much loss of life. So the, 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 the Good Friday Agreement created this very delicate balance, which basically said, look, let's accept that Northern Ireland exists, it's de facto, let's accept that it will remain a part of the UK, but let's accept that it's legitimate to be to live in Northern Ireland, but to consider yourself Irish and to have the ambition, the ambition of one day a united Ireland. And let's try and make these two things coexist. Uh, and the what made that possible was membership of the European Union, because it created the illusion uh, of a sort of frontier, a frontier less uh, Ireland. All right. Um, 
Brexit, you know, brought back this issue of which identity prevails with, with a vengeance. Uh, is it the unionist identity which says the U Northern Ireland is part of the UK and will always remain so, uh, and uh, tough luck on, on those who, who don't feel comfortable with that? Or is it the vision that says, you know, the long term, the medium term destiny of, of Ireland is to be reunited and tough luck on the unionists who, who don't want that? Uh, and, and the two, this is what has happened. And rather surprisingly to me, um, the biggest unionist party, the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, supported Brexit. And this I don't understand because I really, really don't see what was in it for them. Uh, and I think any unionist, most moderate unionists, did understand that Brexit would reopen many of the wounds which had been uh, uh, scarred over by the, um, by the Good Friday Agreement and which had been healed by the Good Friday Agreement. Then you were faced with the problem, what do you do? What's the answer? Um, and the first answer that Mrs. May, when she was prime minister, came up with was indeed a sea border. She said, okay, I acknowledge that you can't have a land border. This is too provocative. This is unmanageable. We need to find another solution. Okay, let's accept that uh, uh, Northern Ireland, there's no border between Northern Ireland and the South of Ireland. That means therefore that the checks which are needed have to take place at the at the ports and the airports of Northern Ireland, let's call it a sea border. She tried to do that. She, of course, was dependent on the Democratic Unionist Party uh, to support her government. She didn't have a majority. And the DUP basically said, no, sorry, this is unacceptable. This is differentiating Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. We won't accept it. So Mrs. Mrs. May, I must say, and it was rather clever of her, she said, OK, I'll find another solution. And the solution she found was what was called the all UK backstop to say, let's keep all of the United Kingdom in the customs union uh, in a way that then considerably reduces the kind of checks that you need to do uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the border, wherever that border is. And she accepted that in that case, it would, it would be a sea border. The DUP also voted against that. <laughs> because they said, uh, no, that's also unacceptable because it's not Brexit. And Boris Johnson, who was not then prime minister, opposed that and said, no, that's not Brexit. We can never accept that. So when he became prime minister, he said, no, I can't accept any of this. I have to renegotiate. But when he actually got into the detail, he discovered he didn't have too many options. So what he accepted was a sea border. He went back to the first option, which Mrs. May had tried and which had been rejected by the DUP. And in fact, Mr. Johnson put himself in the difficult position because Shortly after he became prime minister, he went to Northern Ireland and said, there will never be a sea border. And then a few months later, he had to say, well, actually, there will be a sea border. I've signed a deal which creates a sea border. So, of course, the, 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 the unionist uh, um, uh, parties were, were not happy with this. Um, and it's a very strange arrangement that we arrived at. Basically, it says Northern Ireland is simultaneously uh, part of the EU customs union and single market, and simultaneously part of the UK customs union and single market. Now, as a trade specialist, I've never heard of that. There is no precedent in international uh, uh, trading arrangements for such a situation. So inevitably, it was going to be very complicated to figure out how this was going to work. And one of the most difficult issues was what happened to goods going from Great Britain, so the island of Scotland, England and Wales to Northern Ireland, which ran a risk of going into the south of Ireland and then through the south of Ireland into the, into the onto continental Europe and the single market. Because once they crossed the border into, into, into Ireland, they were in the European Union. Uh, and this has been the great source of difficulty. Uh, and uh, there were very clear understandings reached with the British government about what kind of checks would be needed, how they would be done, where they would be done. And basically, the British government is now reneging on these checks and has declared unilaterally that it does not wish to implement them as agreed, because they must be implemented by the British government. There are not going to be European customs officials uh, in the ports of Northern Ireland. This is the implementation of the protocol in Northern Ireland is done by the UK. So there's an element of trust 
year from the European Union to the UK. And uh, the British government has now um, uh, unilaterally said that they are pos postponing implementing these, these checks by another six months. And frankly, the suspicion on the EU side is that it's first it's six months, then it's another six months, another six months, so that the, this protocol may never be properly implemented, which poses a major problem, particularly uh, uh, creating potentially a, a backdoor uh, for products uh, which don't meet European standards to enter the single market, which is obviously a major concern for, Ireland's, uh, for Ireland, but also for our, our continental partners. Yes, so on, um, do, do you see maybe a, a way how the, the current difficulties can be overcome? Yeah, honestly, I don't, I don't think it's beyond the wit and imagination of us all to, to find solutions. Um, it, it may be that there are ways of being slightly more flexible in the way the EU interprets the checks which are needed. I mean, this, this mostly comes down to uh, food products, agricultural products. Uh, that's where the biggest sensitivity is um, uh, uh, the, the, because of the, the risk of, of, of disease or, 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 or products which are not properly in conformity with uh, European food standards. Um, I, I think it is possible to find ways, but this requires the two sides to sit down and find reasonable compromises. Seen from the European perspective, uh, the UK hasn't even done what it promised it would do under the protocol. They have not set up fully the, the IT systems, which they said they would do. They've not set up the infrastructure at the airports and at the ports actually physically to check the products. Uh, and at the same time, they're now unilaterally basically saying, well, we're not going to do any checks anyway. Uh, and uh, this, I think, more than anything, it's a problem of trust at this point. I, I think it is possible to imagine uh, intelligent compromises. And I, I, I know the, the, the European Commission well. I mean, people say they're very inflexible. Actually, the European Commission is, is pretty good at finding pragmatic uh, solutions uh, to real problems. And I think there are real problems. There have been shortages uh, in the um, in, in supermarkets in Northern Ireland. So, so there's a certain amount of popular discontent about this. But it does require, I mean, the, 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 the first, the sine qua non of, of doing that is that both sides commit that they are going to implement the protocol. The deep suspicion on many in, in the EU is that Mr. Johnson hates what he what he what he had to agree to that he did that under pressure uh, in order to kind of get brexit done and that he is now trying basically little by little to uh, nullify this protocol and basically to to backtrack on it and uh, this may or may not be a fair uh, assessment of his of his intentions but it's certainly the suspicion is there and uh, the latest action of unilaterally uh, postponing uh, the implementation of the checks uh, only only further fuels this. So we, we have, I think, a real crisis of trust coming also from the fact that you may remember uh, a few months ago at the height of the negotiations on the trade deal, the British government introduced legislation in Westminster actually empowering the British government not to implement the protocol, uh, which seemed very strange to people, something that had only been signed and ratified and, and, and approved by the British Parliament only a matter of two or three months later, they said, oh, we now reserve the right not to implement this. I mean, this is du jamais vu uh, in international relations, frankly. And uh, that was the first breach of trust. And now we've had a second a serious breach of trust. So the mood is, is not very constructive just for the moment. Yes, and I think we, we both know as diplomats how it's difficult to, to rebuild uh, trust uh, when, uh, when there are such uh, yeah. conflicts or, or situations. Uh, one of the questions that may come up is also what, uh, what is the position of the uh, American uh, administration, and that will interest our, our audience, I think, here at the French-American Foundation. Um, the, we know that Joe Biden is from Irish descent. He said already that uh, there should be no hard border. Uh, will this have also an influence on on the, on, the, on, the, on this issue? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's important to recall uh, that um, 
the, the first, the main credit for the Good Friday Agreement goes to the people of Northern Ireland, frankly, uh, on both sides, uh, who decided that enough was enough and they had to stop this, this bloodshed and, and, and try to work together. Uh, they were very aided in that by uh, successive British governments, particularly John Major and Tony Blair, who invested hugely in this process, and by the Irish government. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Albert Reynolds, Bertie Ahern, uh, uh, Irish prime ministers took a lot of domestic political risk, as did Tony Blair and as did John Major, to, to make this happen. But And there was a huge help from the European Union. Jack Delors was very supportive. The European Union uh, had a peace program which helped fund a lot of the reconciliation projects. But a very important component was also the American uh, involvement, and particularly, of course, Senator George Mitchell, who was uh, the personal envoy of President Clinton, and President Clinton really uh, uh, was very personally engaged in, in, in the Good Friday discussions, as was Senator Mitchell. So America has a stake in this. America contributed hugely to uh, this uh, process. Uh, and you will recall, uh, well, you're too young, Alexei, but uh, some of us can recall uh, that Irish America was not always on the right side of this discussion. Uh, back in the 70s, Irish America was tempted to provide money to the IRA to fuel the violence uh, in a completely misguided uh, misunderstanding of the situation in Ireland. And it took a lot of effort by the Irish embassy in, in Washington, successive ambassadors, uh, and uh, 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 a number of enlightened uh, American legislators, Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, uh, uh, to basically bring the Irish American community behind the idea of peace and reconciliation and recognizing uh, the intrinsic value of both traditions in Ireland, both the nationalist and the unionist tradition. And so this was what George Mitchell brought to the table and they were very instrumental. So I think this has remained. Uh, in, in, in the American political DNA, if I may say so. So you have the Friends of Ireland, you have Richie Neal, you have younger people like, like Brendan Boyle coming up, uh, and you have people like President Biden, who's a bit older, uh, who deeply lived through this and who are deeply committed. And I, uh, I think Ireland will rely heavily on the influence they can bring to bear on the British government uh, uh, not to not to play games with this uh, this business because it's it's very dangerous. Uh, so uh, I think publicly, of course, uh, and I saw that um, Senator Menendez brought forward a resolution in the Senate uh, uh, yesterday or today, reaffirming uh, the good not just the Good Friday Agreement but all of the agreements which go with it, and they specifically mention the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, so I think there will be pressure, helpful pressure from, from the US side. The thing to remember, the protocol is not perfect. I mean, nobody particularly likes it as, a, as an outcome, but it was the only thing we were able to agree in the context of Brexit. The problem here is Brexit. If the UK was not leaving the European Union, we wouldn't have any of these problems. All the problems we have flow from the decision of the UK to leave. Now, this, of course, is their sovereign decision. We accept that. We regret it, but we accept it. But they have to recognize that this has then an impact on their nearest neighbor, which is the island of Ireland. And it is incumbent also on them to contribute to the solution of the problems which Brexit creates. And that solution, the only one we've been able to find, is the Northern Ireland Protocol for all its imperfections. And nobody likes it. Uh, nobody thinks it's a model of, of, of uh, legal or, or um, uh, economic or political uh, judgment, but it's, it's what, what could be done. And we have to make it work. And talking about renegotiating it or getting rid of it is, is completely misguided. So uh, the American influence in trying to bring uh, the British government back to uh, a recognition that this is the only solution and we have to make it work. This will be matched, I'm absolutely certain, by uh, realism and pragmatism on the part of the European Commission and our member state partners in the European Union. Of course, there will be limits. Uh, the other member states have legitimate concerns about the integrity of the single market, about the security of the, the goods which are put into circulation. They want guarantees, which are in the, the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, about that. But I think there is a way to, to, to marry the, the legitimate defense of the single market with a little bit of pragmatism in the way we implement this to alleviate some of the practical problems that 
ordinary people in Northern Ireland are experiencing. Thank you. Um, if we shift to uh, the situation of uh, more of the south of the Republic of Ireland, which is indeed also affected too by, by the protocol, um, do you think this can be also have an impact on the, the European integration of uh, the further European integration of, of Ireland as it is also uh, bound to, uh, to, to the protocol also uh, and, and, uh, and the relations, relationship with, the, with Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, I think Ireland uh, has made its choice and it's a European choice. Uh, and um, uh, it's interesting to note that when you look at the Eurobarometer surveys, support for the European Union for membership of the European Union in Ireland is one of the highest anywhere uh, uh, in, 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 in Europe. Um, this is in part perhaps slightly inflated by the huge degree of solidarity which was shown by our fellow member states in, in the Brexit negotiations. And this has really struck people because I understand you're Austrian or you're Polish or you're Maltese. I mean, what the hell do you, do you really have to get sucked into <laughs> this, this problem of Northern Ireland and, and uh, you know, the age old dispute between Ireland and the UK? But people did, I think, really uh, understand that this was uh, an existential issue. I think we were very fortunate in having Michel Barnier, who so well understood the situation, and not just from his current role as, as chief negotiator, but when he was a commissioner for regional affairs back in, in, in 99 to, to 2004 with, in the Prodi Commission, he was deeply involved in, in, in helping the situation in Northern Ireland and providing financial support for the, for the um, Good Friday Agreement. And I remember because I was Secretary General of the Commission at the time, he often came back from visits to Northern Ireland and, and really was very emotionally connected, saying this is, this is what Europe is about. This is the kind of reconciliation that we need to be supporting. So this has been a constant theme. For Ireland, uh, membership of the European Union has been hugely beneficial on, on so many levels. So I don't think there's any question of Ireland's commitment uh, to Europe, uh, to future European integration, to further European integration. Of course, there'll be, there'll be issues, <laughs> taxation, uh, one or two other issues where the Irish may not always see eye to eye with, with all our partners. Uh, but no, I think Ireland is, is very committed and, and will continue to be. And, and one of the things that the Irish government has been trying to do is to avoid that this uh, Brexit consequence and the issue in Northern Ireland in any way uh, dilutes or diminishes uh, Ireland's full participation in, in European integration. Thank you. Um, I, I see maybe that my uh, camera is a bit frozen. I hope that it's okay. Well, um, the, sound, the sound is fine. You, the sound is good. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have a last question before opening the floor to, uh, to, to the audience. Um, in this context, you have also the, the perspective of reunification that came back into, uh, into the debate. Uh, a recent survey found that a majority of people in Northern Ireland favored holding a referendum on unity uh, within the next five years. Uh, there are also different comments on uh, on, uh, on reunification. I will I won't come back on that. And what is in fact the, the impact of Brexit on uh, on this issue? Could it really foster the will for it, or at least the discussion about it, as it does in uh, in Scotland uh, concerning independence? And I know also that you, you said that uh, you consider it's not a good idea to to talk about it now. So I'm interested also in in knowing why. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I got I got into some trouble for those remarks, but um, look, I think the medium to long term perspective is Brexit has made reunification probably more likely. Um, uh, I don't want to put a time frame on it. Um, uh, it might happen sooner than we think. It might take a bit longer. Um, but I, I think we we really do need to. Uh, bear in mind that the fundamental issue here is the 900,000 or so unionists in Northern Ireland who don't, at this point in time, don't want to be part of United Ireland. I mean, that's, that's they, they consider themselves British first and Ireland second. So the, the issue of reunification, in my view, is a medium to long-term issue. The Good Friday Agreement provides for the possibility to hold a referendum if it is felt that a majority in Northern Ireland seems to be moving in that direction. Um, but we need to be very careful 
Um, if we talk too much about reunification now, we risk to give the impression that somehow the Northern Ireland Protocol is the, the, the thin end of a wedge which leads you to reunification. And that is only going to make the unionist community in Northern Ireland even more nervous because that's what they kind of suspect. They fear that they are being sucked into a process which leads you to a united Ireland, uh, which is what they don't want. So I, I think, and this is what the Irish government has been very clear about, we need to say, look, these are two separate discussions. One is about the functioning of this protocol, which leaves the constitutional status of Northern Ireland unchanged. It remains an integral part of the United Kingdom and the full provisions of the Good Friday Agreement in that regard continue to apply. And we need to make that work. Then we will have, going forward in a few years time, an ongoing debate about whether reunification uh, would be a good idea, whether we have a majority for it in Northern Ireland. I think those of us like myself who are nationalists and who support reunification need to be very careful. The, the big problem in Northern Ireland comes from the fact that when Northern Ireland was created, a substantial minority of nationalists were brought into that state against their will. They represented about 40% of the population of Northern Ireland and they were deeply unhappy and they created lots of problems. We don't want to recreate the same thing in reverse and have a united Ireland in which we have a 30% of our population who are deeply unhappy with being in a united Ireland and who feel, uh, uh, on, on, who do not identify with this new united Ireland. We don't need to be swapping one set of problems for another. So we need to work on persuading people in Northern Ireland that in the medium term, reunification would be a good thing also for unionists and that it can work and that we can respect both traditions on the island and have a, a position of tolerance and mutual respect and reconciliation and not any sense of, of, of one majority taking over on a minority. That's gonna take time. And all I was saying in my remarks was, let's not mix these two conversations. One is about the Northern Ireland Protocol and the immediate consequences of Brexit. The other is about reunification. Let time do its work and we will see where we get to in a few years. And I personally believe that reunification is where we will end up uh, in, in, in a few, in probably, I don't know, more like 10, 15 years time than five, 10 years, but something like that. Yes. But we need to do it on a basis of consent. Thank you very much. I now open the floor to question from the audience. I don't know how we proceed, uh, Katie or Natalie. I don't know if there are questions, maybe raise your hands if you can through the chat. If anyone has questions, they're welcome to write them into either the Q&A section in the bottom or the chat button at the bottom, and we'll wait for some questions to come in. Thank you. So we're waiting for the first question. So uh, first, we have a, a question on behalf of Arlette Laurent, uh, a guest on today's webinar. What impact, if any, could the parliamentary elections in Scotland in May have uh, on the already highly complex situation for both islands? Um, uh, for example, if a Scottish referendum opted for independence, could it alter the Irish geopolitical landscape? The short answer is, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think if Scotland were to uh, vote for independence, this would dramatically change the context uh, in Northern Ireland, um, because of course it puts into question the functioning of the United Kingdom, which is that to which the unionists are so attached. Um, we could have a whole discussion about Scotland because uh, as many of you will know, there are the elections coming up, uh, but the holding of a second referendum in principle requires the agreement of Westminster. Uh, and the British government have so far said, David Cameron agreed to a referendum uh, in 2014, if memory serves me well. Um, uh, Prime Minister Johnson has said under no circumstances will they agree to another referendum for another generation. So there's a whole conflict about to arise there. We could have a sort of Spanish 
Catalonia situation, uh, would um, Scotland hold its own referendum without the blessing of Westminster? What would be the international recognition of such a referendum? So it's, it's, a, it's a complex argument, but undoubtedly, if uh, through whatever is decided uh, in the British constitutional system, Scotland were to become independent, this would be uh, a big game changer in my view in the debate in, in Ireland. I don't know if we have all the questions somewhere. If not for the moment, maybe in order to allow uh, time to uh, to to ask all the question, I have a, maybe a, a broader look on the on a, a question on broader uh, continent continental dynamics. How do you rate the relations now between the uni United Kingdom and the European Union beyond the Irish issue, and what can be there? evolution in your in your opinion yeah look i i, I think um at the moment we're going through a very difficult phase um it's true that we've had fairly bruising negotiations both on the withdrawal agreement and the protocol and then on the trade and cooperation agreement um and now we have you know further uh, difficulties in the implementation of the protocol um what worries me, I mean, I, I think what we could have hoped for would be that once Brexit was done, once the UK had left, that we could start thinking about how we build, you know, a new partnership between the EU and the United, a United Kingdom, which is no longer a member. And let's face it, they may have left the European Union, but they haven't left Europe. And, and we still have, you know, so many issues to, to, to discuss. And the, the trade and cooperation agreement, which was agreed just before Christmas, has left a lot of unanswered questions, right? Um, but unfortunately, and uh, I mean, I don't want to sound on Julie Partisan because I'm Irish, but I, I can't help but feel that one of the ironies of the situation is that even though the UK has left the EU, they are still utterly obsessed with the EU and seem to judge everything uh, that even happens domestically in terms of the EU. So I've never, the EU seems to be on the front page of British papers all the time, but always in a hostile way, uh, always uh, in an aggressive way. Um, it's almost as if uh, having done Brexit, instead of being able to say, well, now we've left the EU, what do we care about the EU? The, the way to continue to build a certain domestic consensus about the benefits of Brexit is to say how terrible the EU is, right? And this, of course, is, is absolutely uh, antipathetical to building a, a, a new relationship. And, and it seems that this government, this current government, is determined to have as little to do with the EU as such as is possible. They, we've just had the review uh, of the internal review of, of strategy and glo Britain's global positioning and their nuclear policy, their foreign policy. They talk about everything. They talk about a pivot to Asia, uh, Indo India, Indo-Pacific, but almost nothing about cooperation with the EU. Uh, so this is the irony of the situation in which we find ourselves. Uh, Jean-Louis Boulange, uh, a, a French member of the European Parliament, famously said, um, uh, before the referendum, the UK had one foot inside uh, the European Union and one foot outside. It now seems that after Brexit, they have one foot inside and one foot outside. Uh, it's, it's almost as if we're still trapped in this endless debate between domestic British debate about, you know, whether you're pro-EU or, or anti-EU. So the short term is things don't look great. Uh, I hope that wisdom will prevail over time and we will get back to the kind of partnership you would naturally expect between uh, the EU and, and the UK, even, even when the UK is no longer a member of the EU, as we try to have with our other neighbours. Thank you. We have another question from another participant. Uh, how might the upcoming French election affect relations between Ireland and France? And what are the implications, if any, for immigration and trade? Uh, maybe we can also refer to that uh, without saying it. There also a, um, a fear in Ireland that also the, the uh, positions uh, in, in the EU change and, and affect the relations uh, between Ireland and the other member states. 
You know, I don't think so. I mean, obviously, we have, you know, we have uh, elections in the Netherlands today. We have elections in Germany uh, in, in, in September. We have the, the presidential elections in France next year. There are always elections going on, and there are always issues about whether in whichever country the new government will be more pro-EU, less pro-EU, uh, will have positions which are, you know, more or less similar to Irish positions there. By the way, there'll be changes in Ireland. We may have a different, uh, uh, a different government a few years from now. So, no, I don't, I, I honestly, I don't think so. And between Ireland and France, I, I think the only issue uh, of really substantial disagreement is frankly the tax issue, which is a, a well-known issue, uh, been there for for a long time. We'll, you know, maybe we'll 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 find some solutions uh, in the OECD in in, in the coming months. Um, but I think relations between Ireland and France have been very good. Uh, as I said, we were very aligned on, for example, agricultural policy and, and other policies. Uh, so I, 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 I really, you know, I, I, I think Ireland will obviously look at the future evolution of the European Union as everyone is, is looking, you know, are we going for more Europe, less Europe? Um, what, are, you know, how are we going to face some of the challenges of, of Europe in the world with our with Russia, with Turkey, with China, with the United States? Um, but, uh, you know, Ireland is very committed to uh, making a success of the European Union and working with uh, all our partners to do that. And we and we recognize, of course, that now the UK has left a particularly important role falls to, to France and Germany, who have traditionally been the, the, the drivers of, of much of, of, of European integration. Indeed. Uh, thank you. There is another question from François Pages. Uh, is there in the underground a risk of resumption of uh, violence between nationalists and, and unionists? Uh, any signs of new conflicts, maybe uh, renewed troubles, as uh, it was uh, called uh, at the time? I sincerely hope not. Uh, I and, and I genuinely don't think so. I, I think... Um, both sides of, of this uh, divide uh, understand the futility of violence and the enormous damage that was done to people's lives by the violence that did take place. And I think one of the interesting features of the Irish peace process was the fact that in some ways it was led by people who previously had been, had been pretty violent, which is not always easy for the rest of us to accept, to be very frank that people who have blood on their hands, who probably, um, if they didn't directly participate in, in, in murderous actions, uh, led people who did that. Uh, but in the end, they realized the futility of what they were doing on both sides, whether that was the, the IRA or that was the loyalist uh, paramilitaries. And I think all of those people are still convinced that uh, a return to violence would not be, would not be helpful. Um, that's not to say that there may not be some dissident minority voices who may do some crazy things, but uh, I really don't feel that at the moment. But of course, if the political tensions persist over a long period of time and seem to be uh, uh, resistant to any kind of solution, then of course the situation could deteriorate, but we're, we're a long way from that uh, at the moment. We have a, another question on the impact also of Brexit on, on Erasmus. Uh, how will the, the lack of Erasmus opportunities for UK students affect also the, the region? From yeah, from this, is, data, data. This, is, this is one of the saddest things of Brexit. I mean, I was involved in, in setting up Erasmus. It was, I think, it's one of the, one of the best things we, we've ever done. Um, and I think that the decision of the British government not to continue their participation was incredibly petty and small minded. Um, and it's a great loss because I, I think Erasmus uh, was a huge opportunity uh, for young people to travel, to have experience in, in different uh, parts of Europe, uh, to have educational experience. It promoted cooperation between universities, mutual recognition of qualifications, of courses. Um, of course, you can say, and I get this, it was slightly elitist. I mean, it's, you know, uh, uh, university education, um, 
and frankly, even with the money that was given, maybe people needed family, a bit of family support. It wasn't always easy for people with very limited means to participate, but still, it was a, it was a, a generational transformation in Europe. Uh, that's why the Irish government has said that they will continue to fund the participation in Erasmus of students from Northern Ireland. They will pay for that. So at least the students in Northern Ireland will be able to continue to participate in Erasmus. Unfortunately, for the rest of the UK, that is no longer an option. Uh, they have introduced their own scheme called uh, the Turing scheme after Alan Turing, the, the computer scientist. It's much less generous. It's, it's, it's much less based on the, the secret of Erasmus, apart from the student mobility, was the course cooperation and the mutual recognition, so the joint degrees. So it wasn't just students going for a kind of a few months experience in another country. You went as part of a course which led to double degree qualifications or your time spent studying in, in, in the other country was recognized by your home university. This required a lot of work by the university community to develop these um, collaborative uh, projects on, on, on courses. Uh, and and that has been hugely beneficial. And unfortunately, the UK universities are now going to be locked out of that system, which is a loss for them, but also a loss for the rest of us, frankly. There's another question. As a diplomat, are you concerned that Brexit may entice other nations to consider exiting the EU? No, the opposite. I, I, I think Brexit is, is a case study in why leaving the EU is a really stupid thing to do, frankly. Um, I, I think there is no benefit from, from Brexit, uh, uh, and I think most people looking at what has happened in the UK are saying, well, what was the, what was the point of all of this? Uh, what, is, what have you really gained? So, no, I, I, I think the likelihood of anyone else leaving uh, anytime soon is, is extremely remote. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Katie says that uh, we're uh, uh, we are finishing the, the webinar now. Maybe if you want to to add something or have a, the the last word of uh, of this webinar. Yeah. Look, I mean, firstly, thank you very much for this. Um, I, I I I think uh, thank you for your interest in the subject, uh, which is you know maybe a little esoteric, but. Uh, I think what is, you know, the what is happening on the island of Ireland as a result of Brexit should concern people outside of Ireland, uh, uh, in the EU, in the United States. Uh, we're very grateful for all the support which has been shown in the first instance, as I said, from our, our European partners, but also uh, the, the 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 strong support from from the US uh, for peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland and. I'm sure, I'm sure we're going to find a way through this. Uh, I, I remain optimistic, even if we're probably going to go through some, some bumpy weeks and months ahead, but I'm, I'm absolutely certain that goodwill and common sense will, will, will prevail in the end. And I also believe that between the, the EU and the UK, we will get back to uh, a warmer and, and closer relationship uh, uh, between uh, UK no longer part of the EU and, and, and the rest of the EU, because that, we're condemned by geography and by by mutual self-interest uh, to to achieve that kind of understanding, and I'm I'm sure we will. But it's it's going to take a little bit of time. And thank you very much for the opportunity to to join you today. Thank you so much. I just wanted to log in to say uh, thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, Alexi, for your thoughtful moderation. Uh, I appreciate ending on this optimistic note. Um, before we log off, I just wanted to note that the Foundation's next webinar will be held next week on March 24th with the political science professor and peace builder Severine Auster, who will talk about her new book, The Front Lines of Peace, an insider's guide to changing the world. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.